everyone. Uh, so, this is that quantum mechanics part of the course that you will be learning with me and um, in this course we will uh, talk about um, uh, introductory quantum physics, the way it has been developed, the historical developments and uh, uh, various things that are associated with it, the central principles of quantum mechanics and um, uh, we will talk about the equation that you solve just like the analogous of uh, uh, you know the Newton's laws which gives you the, uh, the position as a function of time. Uh, here you will be getting a wave function, it is a differential equation for the wave function which we call as the Schrodinger equation and we will have to solve that for uh, a number of situations. Uh, before that let us review a little bit of uh, quantum physics and why it was needed when classical mechanics was doing very well. So, let me uh, in that context, let me uh, draw a diagram so as to show that uh, what is quantum mechanics and how it lies with regard to what you have seen earlier. So, uh, this is where let us say the non relativistic quantum mechanics. Uh, sorry, non relativistic classical mechanics. So, we will call it as NR non relativistic and classical mechanics is CM, ok. And then uh, what you have learnt is a non relativistic, um, uh, sorry, a relativistic classical mechanics. So, let us call it as a RCM, ok, uh, which involves uh, Lorentz transformation equations, equation of the, uh, the how the electric fields and the magnetic fields transform, how the uh, equation of motion transforms according to Lorentz relativity and so on. Uh, then uh, you have uh, been or you will be taught that here we will write NR and a QM. So, that is a non relativistic quantum mechanics which is what this part of the course teaches you and, um, and then uh, something that will never be taught to you, uh, it is taught to the masters level and at the PhD level is the relativistic quantum mechanics ok. So, let me uh, replace this by uh, this notation that I have been using. So, it is NRCM <coughs> this is NRQM, this is RQM and so on and so forth. Uh, this will not be taught uh, because this involves higher level of uh, mathematical formalism which is so which cannot be taught at this first year undergraduate level, uh, but we will be seeing say let us say 1 and uh, 2 and 3, 1 and 2 you have already seen and um, this 1 it is actually the uh, most correct one or the most appropriate one because uh, the all the other three quadrants that you see can be obtained as a limiting case for this ok. And what is the limiting case? So, uh, you go from relativistic to non relativistic by assuming that your V by C goes to 0 ok. So, uh, in the limit the speed of the particle or the velocity of the particle when that is much smaller than the speed of light, uh, we go from relativistic to non relativistic. And similarly, we will um, talk about a quantity called as a H all right. And this quantity will be called as the Planck's constant and this Planck's constant going to 0 will actually get me into from a, a <coughs> quantum regime, quantum mechanics to classical mechanics ok. So, uh, in the limit of both that is V by C going to 0, H going to 0, we are in the quadrant that we are, we have taught at the beginning and um, this can be dealt with, uh, with the uh, Newton's law of motion. And um, in this particular um, course, you have learnt using the Lagrange's equation of motion, which holds an additional uh, advantage 
of knowing which path the particle takes in going from say uh, x i t i to x f t f. Okay, so uh, if I uh, draw it like this, so this is the your x t. So this is a point, initial point, which has x i t i as its uh, space and time coordinates, and it uh, finally will have to go and land up at this x f. Tf, um, and then it can take a large number of paths in going from here to here and there are in principle infinite number of paths. Uh, Newton's law uh, fails to address which exact path does it take in going from this point A to the point B. However, the Lagrange's equation of motion actually takes into account that by saying that it takes a specific path for which the action is the minimum and you have learned that action is actually nothing but the LDT. So this will be minimum and that is a given path that path will uh, be taken by the classical particle. Okay? So this is when we are in the in the quadrant that is on the right lower and then uh, if your v by c is not equal to 0, your h still continues to be 0, you are in the, um, the left lower quadrant. Uh, similarly, when your v by c is still small but h is not equal to 0, you are in the third quadrant which is the right upper and in this particular case, your neither h equal to 0 nor v by c equal to 0. So, this is the case which is the, the most appropriate case for the description of a particle. Unfortunately, we will have to miss that. Okay? So, this is where we stand in order to um, <clears throat> talk about uh, quantum physics as it is you know, introduced to a first year student. All right. So, uh, let me remove this. So, as the name suggests that uh, quantum physics uh, talks about quantized energy levels, uh, this is the most important thing that you have uh, probably heard. And um, now, the quantized levels or quantized values are not really uh, only that happens in quantum mechanics, it is not true, it happens in classical mechanics as well. Suppose you are talking about the uh, open organ pipe or closed organ pipe, you will see that the frequencies are quantized either as you know uh, uh, integer times, um, it is like nu over 4L or nu over 2L depending upon whether you have uh, open or closed. And um, uh, so there the frequency, you do not get any frequency that is in between these values. Okay? Um, and uh, however, there is no quantum physics there. As I said, the quantum physics has to come with the scale h, okay, which is called as a Planck's constant. So, the uh, energy difference between two energy levels will actually be, uh, the scale will be uh, proportional to h uh, and that is what uh, will make a uh, uh, particle uh, to be called as a quantum mechanical particle. Second thing is that there is something very fundamental about mathematics which says that the, there is a superposition principle. Okay? So, if you uh, can superpose um, the two solutions of say a second order differential equation, uh, you will get a solution uh, for the same differential equation. So, uh, suppose uh, y1 and y2 are the two solutions of uh, differential equation. Um, so, some C1 Y1 plus C2 Y2 would still be a solution of the differential equation and this call is a superposition principle. Okay? And this is uh, the feature of all linear differential equations and uh, we as we will see later that these are, um, there will be linear differential equation that we will be talking about which is as I said Schrodinger equation. So, the superposition will be uh, valid there as well. 
so uh, we will uh, talk about all of them and i just on a on a very general ground i said that it's not always that uh, you don't see all the features to be different there are some features which are uh, similar as well but you have to understand where the difference lies okay <clears throat> so uh, just to tell you that you know the ultimate aim of all of physics is to understand everything within a given um, framework within the same framework and uh, this is why we all uh, try to study physics that we understand all the say the forces of nature okay whether we are uh, completely successful in that in understanding all the four fundamental forces of nature that's a question that remains to be answered but at least for the description of microscopic particles or the subatomic particles or the quantum particles uh, even though most of the time it involves a complicated mathematical formalism uh, we have been able to find a description which is still presentable to the first year students okay so this is what we uh, we will do for the for the most of the course <laughs> and uh, one of the very important um uh part of or rather uh, sort of uh, uh, what do you call the um, uh, <coughs> foundation of quantum physics is what is called as a probabilistic interpretation and uh So what it means is the following that we cannot talk about the exact position uh, of the particle uh, during the course of its motion. So a particle is definitely will move from one point to another even a quantum particle will move but will not be able to talk about its exact position or say it with certainty and uh, there has to be a uh, a probabilistic interpretation that will come in and the determinism that you have seen all the while in classical mechanics will have to go away that is uh, this is the position of the particle at a given time that notion has to be changed and uh, we should uh, be able to only talk about probability of finding the particle and um, uh, this is similar to uh, what we talk about uh, tossing a coin that this is a probability with which we get half uh, in in uh, during the tossing of the coin okay so that tells you that if there is a particle that goes from uh, a x1 y x1 t1 to a x2 t2 uh, using classical mechanics we can specify that path whereas there is always an uncertainty in the path in going from uh, a particular point to another point and so on and um, so uh, this is uh, the probabilistic interpretation and uh, we'll talk about this uh, probabilistic interpretation for all the quantum particles okay and uh, to uh, tell you very uh, clearly about this probabilistic interpretation uh, let us talk about a very familiar example which is a Young's double slit experiment. Okay, let me write down. Okay, so there is a, a, a source of light. Okay, so this is the source. And this is uh, the two slits, let us call them as S1 and S2. Okay, and there is a screen out there. And uh, what happens is that um, according to Huygens principle, this classical optics, um, the interpretation that I am going to give is something new and it goes beyond this, uh, uh, this uh, you know, uh, <coughs> the Young's double slit experiment. So there is a, a coherent source, say, for example. And there are two slits there. These two slits will uh, 
uh, act like secondary sources and uh, they will uh, sort of let the light pass through and this light will pass through and will make a pattern here which is forming alternate dark and brow, uh, bright bands on the screen. Okay? So, when the intensity goes to 0, so this is a region of dark bands okay, because there is no light that is coming in and uh, there is a, a region of, uh, of bright bands which is just um, adjoining that. And so, there will be a, a bright dark, bright dark uh, bands that will appear on the screen. Okay? Now, uh, it gives many information. Uh, it gives, first of all, it gives an information about whether light should be considered as a particle. Because initially, Newton thought that light is made of particles, which is called as a Newton's corpuscular theory of light. Okay? Um, and uh, if, uh, because he thought that since light gets reflected from the mirror, uh, it must be uh, particles because it gets reflected and only particles get reflected. And then there are many experiments including this one, uh, which is interference experiment. So, this is called Young's double slit uh, experiment or, or other diffraction experiments. Uh, light does not show up as particles because particles do not interfere. And why particles do not interfere? If we change the source of light by bullets, Okay, or there are you know small uh, stream of uh, macroscopic particles that are made to pass through. They'll simply go and make one uh, bright uh, one sort of uh, uh, mark here, okay, which is parallel to this, and they'll go and make another one here. And you'll see that there are two uh, uh, sort of bands that form, and there's no interference, and which is not too difficult to understand that uh, without light this interference will not um, happen. What if we try to understand the corpuscular theory of light by slowing down the stream of uh, these light particles. Now, the light particles have a name which is called as the photons. Okay? It is called as a quantum of light. So, these photons are made to uh, go through the slit uh, in very low uh, speed. Suppose you can, uh, you, you send a photon, then wait for some time, send another photon, send, wait for some time, send another one, and then again wait and so on and so forth. You keep, you know, waiting for very long time and you will see that same interference pattern will emerge. So, it is not about that the, the photons are actually acting like or behaving like particles, they have a wave nature associated with that. But now coming to the interference pattern, uh, what does the photon interfere with? Do they interfere with themselves and so on? That is the question. So, one of the things that uh, this establishes is that, that there is a, a wave nature associated with light which all of us know because, uh, uh, because this uh, interference cannot happen with particles. Okay? So, this is one of the things that was established. The second thing that was established is that if I block this slit, I completely block it okay, by putting some kind of a stopper. Uh, the question is whether the interference pattern will survive. And the question and the answer is no, the interference pattern will not survive because by blocking one slit, you have made all the photons pass through this second slit, which means that you have made the, uh, the trajectory or the motion of the photons to be deterministic and not probabilistic. So, the very fact that there is an interference pattern is the probabilistic nature of the photons that it can go either go through this. Slate, slate S1 or the slate S2 and these probabilities they actually interfere. Okay? And if you block one of them, that tells you that there is, uh, if it goes through the other slate, there will be no um, <coughs> interference of the pattern that you will see there and it is going to be completely 
a sort of a beam of photons coming and impinging on the screen and you will probably see a spot there, a bright spot so to say, but no interference pattern. So that tells you that uh, there is a probabilistic interpretation in uh, action. It tells you something more. It tells you that when you are uh, blocking this slit, you are making someone maybe a demon, okay, who's making this measurement that the photons are indeed going through that slit. So, the moment you make a measurement, quantum mechanics is gone <coughs> and classical mechanics sets in. Let me give you an example. Take a coin <coughs> and toss the coin. Toss the coin really hard so that it goes really high in the air. Okay? The coin when it starts its descent or when it is going up, either of them, you have in your mind it is going on that whether, suppose your call is head, so whether it will come to the ground as a head or tail, it is going on. So your mind is a superposition of states which is superposition of head and tail. You may want head, but it is not guaranteed. When it actually comes down on the ground and, or you hold it on your hand and then you uh, actually see that whether it is head or tail. Okay? So uh, it is a superposition that matters and the moment you it has uh, landed on the ground or it has landed on your palm, you know that whether it is uh, head or tail. So till it is in air, the quantum mechanics is in action. So it is in the superposition of states head and tail. Okay? And it is uh, uh, finally when it um, <coughs> is, uh, it, it lands on a surface you know whether it is uh, actually head or tail and then quantum mechanics goes and in in the sort of in, and instead the determinism shows up. Okay? Uh, this has been nicely uh, explained, this particular feature has been nicely explained by um, uh, a box. Okay? Um, I mean this is called as a Schrodinger's cat experiment. So there is a cat. Okay? Uh, I do not know how to draw a cat, but let us say that it is like this and uh, so this is a cat that is there and this cat is enclosed in a box. The cat cannot go out of the box okay? and uh, there is a poison pill that is kept right here, okay? a poison uh, uh, kind of uh, you know uh, a thing that is um, that con contains poison and there is also a hammer. So what it says is that if the uh, the cat it uh, is mischievous, plays with the hammer, the hammer falls on the bottle, uh, the bottle will break, the poison will come out, and the cat will die. And if somehow the cat feels that this is a very unknown territory, and I shouldn't be you know meddling with such uh, a, a sort of uh, dangerous looking thing then it won't do anything and it will still survive. Okay? Uh, so, and uh, you leave the room and in when you leave the room and in your mind it is going, uh, you may want, of course you want the cat to survive, but you also have a fear whether the cat will die by, uh, you know, meddling with this or playing with, uh, with this uh, thing. So, uh, so, till you do not see it, it is a quantum mechanics which is a probabilistic superposition of the cat being dead and the cat being alive. Okay? Just like a coin tossing problem, it has half probability because there are only two states, uh, the <coughs> dead and alive. So, it has half probability that the cat will be dead and the other half probability that the cat will be alive. And now you enter the room, see the box and you see the cat to be alive. Okay? So the moment you make the measurement, the measurement is the key. So the role of the observer is very important in quantum mechanics. Okay? Just like as I said that um, you make the coin 
uh, land on a surface then you know uh, that it has either its head or tail uh, just like the cat is dead or alive. So, the, uh, the role of the observer is also important. So, this actually shows a number of things and one of the most important things as I said is the probabilistic interpretation of quantum mechanics. You must let that happen that the you cannot talk about the position of the particle with certainty and you cannot uh, talk about the that the particle has taken particularly this path which is possible in quantum mechanics or in classical mechanics but not in uh, quantum mechanics ok. So, uh, so these are uh, the, the first thing that one should learn. Let me uh, then go to the further details of uh, you know how the quantum theory was developed and uh, why was there a need of uh, quantum theory. And so, the first thing is uh, why quantum mechanics? What was wrong with classical mechanics? So, why quantum mechanics? And uh, if you try to understand that this was uh, really in the beginning of the 20th century which means 1900 and uh, you know 15, 20, 25 and so on. And uh, there what happens was that um, uh, to tell you very frankly that it was um, science used to be done by people who can afford to do that ok. So, the, the people who uh, enjoyed king's patronage etc or uh, the royal patronage they could do science and that is why science was always you know uh, done by the people who were affluent. And uh, one such uh, experiment at that time was done by uh, somebody called Kirchhoff and what did he do is that uh, he uh, saw that when a metal is heated uh, it emits radiation ok. And um, as you keep heating the metal it uh, becomes um, you know red hot. So, the red color uh, you see uh, the metal as a red color and we know that it is called red hot because it is very hot and so on. And then it becomes white hot which is probably hotter and then uh, beyond a certain temperature of course, the metal will melt. But some of these metals are very large uh, 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 temperature melting temperature and uh, if you uh, go to this blacksmith shop uh, who makes all these uh, you know domestic am ammunitions uh, uh, such as the ones that are used in uh, kitchen or they are used in gardening and all that. So, they are made by uh, beating up uh, the, uh, the metal which uh, at very large temperature when they become slightly softer. So, you beat them to, to have a shape that is convenient for operations either in the kitchen or in the garden and then they have they also try to quickly you know cool it down by putting it into water such that it retains that shape and, and is no more you know uh, it does not uh, um, uh, change its shape any further. So, uh, this is uh, was a uh, thing that was a uh, thing of research that uh, why um, different metals uh, emit different wavelengths upon heating ok. And in that regard um, one actually uh, understood that there are two things that uh, are important in this regard that is the uh, lambda which is a wavelength of this emitted radiation as I said from red to, uh, to white and so on um, red is <laughs> you know I mean in the uh, in the Vibgeor scale uh, the violet is at about the 4000 angstrom and red is about close to 8000 angstrom and so on. Uh, so, that is the wavelength and T is the capital T always we use it for temperature. So, these are the two important uh, quantities that are um, you know there uh, for this particular uh, emission of electromagnetic radiation. Why when it changes 
lambda, you know, it has changed. It is no, no longer red or it's no longer blue. It has become white or it's no longer white. It has, uh, it is red and so on and so forth. Okay. And uh, this is called as one can define a quantity called as the uh, E, uh, which is a function of lambda and T. This is called as the uh, emissive power. which is also called as the emissivity, okay. Uh, and uh, so this E is the emissivity and there is also another quantity called as the absorptivity. So this is uh, absorptive power. And very importantly, uh, they, uh, you can define a ratio which is uh, E of lambda t divided by A of lambda t and this ratio is uh, actually called as, um, it is just a, uh, <coughs> uh, it is found to be by Lord Kirchhoff, it is found to be constant for all bodies, okay. It is constant, this emissive power and the absorptive power, absorptive means that how much it absorbs of the incident radiation and this constant is equal to 1 for black bodies. Well, there is nothing quantum mechanics about that, but it is also important to know that this was, this is the way it started uh, and uh, when people started wanted to understand, so this definition of black body is that uh, whatever is uh, uh, is <coughs> incident on it, it is absorbed and because it is absorbed nothing comes out and that is why it is called black, it is called black body, that is the definition of black body. Uh, one can uh, define, okay, uh, so can I go to that uh, other board, okay. <coughs> so um, Kirchhoff defined that the energy density which you write it as small u lambda t this is equal to uh, 4 e lambda t divided by c where c is the speed of light and uh, u uh, is your um, is your energy density <coughs> uh, and your E is emissivity which we have defined and C is the, as I told you, that is the speed of light. Uh, then there were two laws that were uh, proposed, one by somebody called Vian. I will not uh, give a derivation of these laws, but just let you know that such a law exists. And uh, this uh, uh, law says that this U of lambda t it is equal to, but they can be, uh, as I told you that they can be derived without much problem and uh, this is a function of lambda t, okay. Uh, so, uh, Vian said that this uh, quantity, which is the energy density, let me write that, energy density is 1 by uh, lambda to the power 5, lambda being the wavelength of light and some unknown function, some unknown fitting function uh, which depends on lambda into t, not on individually on lambda and t. And uh, uh, this is later on uh, by uh, two gentlemen called as Raleigh and uh, in our pronunciation it will be genes where it's, it should be called as Jean. So, it is a Rayleigh genes law, uh, they gave uh, Rayleigh same as Lord Rayleigh, uh, Rayleigh ra uh, radiation etc. there. So, uh, he has uh, or they have said that this u uh, uh, lambda t, uh, in fact they wrote it in terms of uh, uh, nu which is a frequency, uh, but uh, will define frequency and uh, uh, 
wave uh, wavelength shortly. So they say that this is equal to uh, 8 pi c square, uh, sorry, 8 pi nu square divided by c cube and a kt, okay. All right. So uh, uh, both came up with some energy density form and uh, when they try to actually fit the experimental data, the experimental data actually is like this. This is the form of the experimental data where uh, you have, you know, uh, the three temperature which are T1, T2, T3 uh, and uh, you have uh, for three different temperature and uh, what happens is that uh, this, uh, the Wien's law which is the first one, uh, it goes like this. So this is Wien's on the left, let me uh, use a color. So this was Wien's law, it just goes all the way up to infinity and uh, let me also use um, another color for the Rallagen's law. So the Rallagen's law will go like this, okay. So this is Rallagen's, we will write it with Rj and Wien's. So you see the most important thing is that uh, it could not explain the non-monotonic dependence which, it, which is that it, it just goes up and comes down as a function of uh, you know the wavelength. Uh, so this is as a function of wavelength which I forgot to write. So this as a function of the wavelength, uh, it goes up, shows a, a, a downward curvature at some value of lambda, let us call it a lambda c so to say and so on. So this is lambda c1, lambda c2, lambda c3 and then again comes down and vanishes at very large values or, or tend to vanish at very large values of lambda. But these two theories completely fail to capture that one of them diverges in the uh, lower wavelength limit and the other actually shows a divergence at intermediate but goes to zero. So both put together may actually have something meaningful but there is no uh, hint of uh, you know uh, something that goes up and comes down and this was the failure of classical theory of electromagnetic radiation which is that of light, okay. And uh, it was Planck, <coughs> Max Planck who solved this but uh, uh, the Max Planck actually uh, made uh, or rather arrived at a solution as uh, a matter of desperation. You know, he was desperate to solve this and uh, he could solve it um, by uh, saying that, you know, you, uh, you <coughs> take this, let me come back to this board, uh, let that be there. So think of this experiment, so there is a box there and you have taken a hollow uh, shape of uh, maybe a metallic thing uh, and you have made a small hole there, okay. So there is a small hole that you have made and uh, this is an oven, this one outside the box is an oven whose temperature can be um, increased or decreased at will. So as you start increasing the, uh, the temperature of this oven, uh, you see that there are this, um, this hole uh, will uh, let out the electromagnetic radiation with certain frequency coming out. As the uh, wave, as the, as the temperature increases, uh, the, the color of the radiation that comes out or the color of light that comes out would be different just that experiment that we have stated. And, um, and uh, it, it sort of changes as we saw. Uh, so what Planck proposed is that uh, it is um, the walls of this cavity or walls of this uh, shape so to say, uh, they act like oscillators and they can only 
um, exchange energies with the surrounding which means it, it can let the energy out to the surrounding which means inside the oven and the oven is see through so you can see it uh, the light that is coming in coming out so to say and uh, if uh, uh, that happens then this energy these uh, walls of this uh, of this shape uh, or this um, the entire thing consists of oscillators just like harmonic oscillators that you have learned and they can exchange energy with the surrounding uh, not in any by any amount but they can only exchange by this amount which is given by n h nu when nu is the uh, frequency of the radiation and your nu is equal to c over lambda and things like that okay so that's the relation between the frequency and the wavelength which you all know c is the speed of here is the speed of light and uh, so it can only exchange uh, with the surrounding by letting one oscillator go or two oscillators or three oscillators and not one and a half oscillators not by h nu by 2 or 3 h nu by 2 and that is where uh, the if, if when he said that he could write down uh, an expression so to say <coughs> I will write it in terms of the frequency but now you know that they are same so it is e nu t is equal to some uh, which is <coughs> you know uh, modifying the Rayleigh's law it is uh, 4 pi uh, uh, nu square uh, by c q uh, it is h nu divided by exponential h nu by k t minus 1 uh, there is a factor of 2 when you see the books which is uh, related to the uh, handedness of photons uh, let us not worry too much about it but uh, this is the expression that Planck wrote down as I said uh, under desperation in order to solve this problem but later on it was very nicely derived by uh, S. N. Bose okay and this is uh, eventually called as a Bose-Einstein statistics uh, so this this statistics this distribution function you see uh, the other the Rayleigh's uh, expression uh, here did not have this um, thing that you see it here uh, h nu divided by exponential h nu by uh, kt and that was Planck's contribution to this thing so uh, okay and uh, was eventually derived by uh, SN Bose <coughs> all right so uh, once when you take into account this factor instead of the factor uh, instead of without the factor it nicely has the u of nu t or u of lambda t say for example uh, as a function of lambda it nicely shows a behavior which is experimentally seen so that tells you that uh, the a continuous nature of the radiation emitted by a uh, black body or any body so to say uh, is uh, is incorrect so the classical uh, radiation of uh, electromagnetic radiation formula is incorrect which both vn and uh, uh, ralegens used what is correct is this planck's formula which takes into a concern sorry i have missed a n here uh, Planck's formula which uses this uh, distribution and has this inherent assumption that the energy can be only absorbed or emitted in terms of uh, some uh, uh, quantum of h nu uh, in, in integer uh, time some h nu and you cannot have anything in between uh, uh, energy transfer between these two and uh, this if you take this into account uh, many other things can be derived such as uh, which are called as the Stefan's law and, and so on and so forth and let me write down the value of h which is what I have been saying the Planck's contribution and so h has a value which is 6.63 into 10 to the power minus 34 joule second and uh, um, this uh, has the unit 
of uh, angular momentum and uh, uh, that is not difficult to see because that is what Bohr had said uh, that the angular momentum of these energy atomic energy levels are quantized and uh, these MVR or the angular momentum act actually is like uh, NH cross or NH. So, there is a, a related quantity which we often use is called H cross which is equal to H over 2 pi. Okay, so, you just divide this quantity by 2 pi and uh, that is how we will uh, you know. <coughs> uh, so, th this is the necessity of uh, classical mechanics as uh, sorry necessity of quantum mechanics in lieu of classical mechanics. The classical mechanics was good for macroscopic particles at small velocities and we have learned enough about it. Now is the time that we see that what happens to the description of microscopic objects, what happens to the description of uh, you know so to say lasers, what happens to the description of uh, neutrons, electrons, protons etc. inside an atom and so on. <clears throat> okay? So, this is the birth of quantum mechanics which uh, as I said happened by desperation, but it turned out to be correct which was later on um, uh, proved or rather uh, actually uh, from first principle derived by Bose and uh, which gave rise to a very important uh, phenomena called as a Bose-Einstein condensation. It was uh, discovered in 1924. Uh, however, um, it took about 70 years, more than 70 years in fact, uh, to observe this phenomena uh, of Bose-Einstein condensation which happened eventually in 1995. All right. So, uh, since we have um, learned the basic things about uh, quantum mechanics that is a probabilistic interpretation and the uh, this uh, need for invoking quantum ideas for uh, for light. Uh, and by the way, it is not only light for uh, photons are massless particles, okay? uh, but it is also for massive particles, massive means which have mass, uh, I am not saying that they are very heavy or something. But for massive particles such as electrons and neutrons, uh, similar phenomena that have been seen for light can also be uh, obtained for, uh, for electrons and neutrons and so on. And um, uh, like uh, the interference phenomena for electrons are regularly seen and the neutrons actually undergo a diffraction phenomena just like light and uh, material properties can be understood. Okay. Uh, so, let me uh, go to the next thing which let us call it as uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Okay. Uh, so, Heisenberg understood that uh, if you have to make a measurement, you need to interact with the system. Okay? You cannot make a measurement without interacting with the system. And uh, this is very true, right? If you want to, you know, uh, <coughs> measure the uh, a certain length by using a ruler, you need to hold it and, and place the ruler or even if you do not want to hold it you need to place the ruler to be very close to uh, close to that <coughs> length that you want to measure. Okay? So, it is very important that uh, uh, you uh, while doing a measurement we interact with the system just like in the uh, Young's double slit experiment I told you that you, uh, you interact with the system by blocking one of the slits which means that you have a demon or you have a, a person who is measuring uh, that the, the photons are going through uh, the, the lower slit when the upper slit is blocked. Okay? So, it is a measurement and again a measurement is very important that uh, the Schrodinger's cat 
was seen to be alive after you make the measurement okay so uh, so this measurement itself that is the interaction with the system quantum system is uh, introduces a certain uncertainty and this uncertainty will understand it in a uh, in a more uh, significant way but let me uh, tell you that um, suppose you want to uh, measure the position and momentum of an electron okay uh, so what do you do you uh, you cannot see an electron and neither we actually do all these measurements uh, in the microscopic world by using our naked eye we use a microscope and so on and you cannot see anything if you do not have uh, light so a light is made to incident on an electron okay so this is an electron it's probably moving and you shine light on this and you want to measure you want to see it you want to have a look at the position of the uh, of the electron okay so uh, the the position of the electron uh, would be um, uh, given when this electron actually uh, reflects light and you either see it by some detecting instrument either this could be eye or this could be some microscope and so on uh, so uh, to, to determine the position accurately okay uh, you need light of short wavelength because the wavelength that you use is very important uh, so that we can actually see the position of the particle because the electron has a size which is of the order of you know picometer or femtometer or you know angstrom or 10 to the power minus 10 etc etc meter okay so uh, nanometer say for example so we use wavelength of that order if you use radio waves to determine the position of an electron it's of no use if somebody says that you measure this uh, length of this chalk box and you take a you know meter scale you will be making a lot of uh, measurements which will not make any sense okay so here you need short uh, uh, the light of short wavelength at, in order to have a, a position of the uh, particle to be measured accurately okay uh, so <clears throat> now uh, if you want to calculate the momentum of this particle accurately momentum means the mass into velocity okay you need to give it a large kick okay so uh, there is a necessity in order to give a large kick uh, you uh, need to give a large uh, velo i mean uh, the velocity will be or rather the wavelength uh, to be used will be large okay so on one hand in order to uh, make uh, measure the position you need shorter wavelength to incident on it and to measure the velocity you need larger wavelength to incident on it i'll give you another example uh, if you have uh, but before that let me write down the uh, the uncertainty relation the uncertainty relation goes as <coughs> delta x into delta p which is uh, i'll write it equal to but it doesn't have to be it can be of the order of h cross and so on okay so the uncertainty in the position so this is uncertainty in the position and uh, the delta p will be uncertainty in momentum and importantly this right hand side is not zero for microscopic particle okay if you want to measure what is the uh, uncertainty in position uncertainty in momentum say for a 1 kg uh, ball uh, which is uh, which is being you know bowled at say for example um, <clears throat> 120 kilometers per hour you will find that this uh, this product to be extremely small 
uh, and it won't make sense of measuring. But when uh, you make these quantities to be of the order of h cross, which is 10 to the power minus 34 uh, meter, uh, so 34 joule second, uh, then these uh, uncertainties in the position and the momentum make sense. I'll give you an example. Uh, this you can do it in your uh, uh, in your computer when you have you all know a little bit of Mathematica, MATLAB, or some other plotting thing, and so on. So suppose uh, I ask you to draw a sine wave, okay, which is sine k x, okay, and you'll plot that. So it is. I'm just saying that you know you don't. Uh, it goes like this, but then we only look at one. Uh, <clears throat> peak of it. Okay. Now, if I ask you that superpose two sine waves, that is draw sine k1 x plus sine k2 x, okay, with 2 k1 and k2, you will see that uh, in the same scale, it is a little more peaked. And for three of them, say sine k1 x you can choose your k1, k2, k3, sin k2x plus sin k3x, it is more peaked like this and so on, okay. I am only taking one envelope, I am not saying that I am uh, trying to draw the sine function here, okay. A, you just uh, only, um, you know, uh, sort of, uh, of course, it goes like this, it goes like this and, and so on. So, I am only looking at the uh, envelope uh, which peaks. Uh, if you superpose infinite number of signs, it will look like a delta function, okay. So, it will look like a function if you have a large number of them, it just looks like in space it is like this, okay. So, there are infinite number of k's. Uh, superposed there. So, what you did is that you have uh, been able to uh, locate the position of the particle here. So, the particle is here. If it corresponds to a particle, it is here, okay. And um, uh, so, the momentum uncertainty is infinitely large, okay. So, uh, because it required you to use the k, k is the momentum because p is equal to h cross k. Uh, so, this momentum you have used a very large number of them and when you have done that, uh, you have uh, let the momentum uncertainty to, uh, you know, go to infinity and uh, so, uh, in order to um, make a particle uh, be located precisely in space, you have to give away uh, or rather give up the momentum the measurement of the particle and this exactly is meant by this thing, okay. So, uh, you have uh, this relation and we will do a nice experiment in the following uh, discussion class say for example, that uh, how an experiment actually measures this uh, real experiment so to say and uh, there are these kind of things as well when the delta E and delta T also uh, uh, follows a relation like this and the delta J and delta phi uh, also follows a similar relation where E is the energy. So, it is the uncertainty in energy, uncertainty in time and there is the uncertainty in the angular momentum and there is the uncertainty in the uh, angular variable. Uh, you do not need the last one, but we may need the, the one that is uh, the first and second one. Let us call it as 1 and 2 and 3. 1 and 2 will need um, <coughs> quite uh, extensively for the determination of uh, this. How we calculate delta x? How we calculate delta p for a given problem? We will have to, we'll have to learn that, okay. Uh, till that time, uh, let me stop here and uh, <clears throat> we will uh, continue with uh, you know, uh, the wave particle duality and uh, more on this, uh, on this uh, uncertainty principle 
in uh, terms of an experiment called as the Stone Gerlach experiment.